I'm honored to be here as your interim interim pastor. When I was here in August, I, I never thought that the turn of events would be such as they have been and that I would be asked to be, serve, to be able to serve here among you. I assure you that I will do my very best to honor the Lord and attend to your needs as, a, as a, in providing pastoral care for you. Uh, the, uh, the, method, the lesson this morning is Philippians uh, chapter 4, the first seven verses. Paul writes, Therefore, my brethren, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. And I ask you also, true yoke fellow, help these women, for they have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let all people know your forbearance. The Lord is at hand. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, as always, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the familiarity of these words, and yet some words that you share with us, though familiar, sometimes just don't seem to accomplish their goal in us. And so I pray that as I share today that you will speak deeply into our hearts with the resultant peace that you promise. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In churches that I've served the Sunday closest to Veterans Day, which is Wednesday, I always like to honor veterans. I am not a veteran. My father was a World War II veteran, and I remember attending Memorial Days very, very proudly with him, day services proudly with him. I preached here actually on what was designated Veterans Sunday three years ago. But uh, I didn't ask the elders for permission to do this, but I pray that I'm not overstepping my bounds. I was wondering if, as I call out the branch of the military, if you would stand, that we might acknowledge you. Um, and the Army always gets called first for some reason, so if you've served in the United States Army, would you please stand and then just remain standing? If you have served in the Air Force, would you please stand? If you have served in the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, our son-in-law is a Coast Guard veteran, one of them. From the depths of my heart, I thank you for your military service. I thank you for the sacrifice that you made. And uh, I would just like to invite all of us as a church family to join in a modest expression of gratitude with our applause. You may be seated. I'd like to tell you how I met this man, had his connections actually with Teen Challenge, but 
His name was Tom Avery, and uh, we became very, very good friends. He served in the Marine Corps, having enlisted in the early 1940s as a man who was too young to sign up himself, so he needed to get his mother's signature. He was from Georgia. He proudly served in the South Pacific during the Second World War, served in Korea, in China, and two tours in Vietnam. When he retired after more than 30 years of service in the Marine Corps, he was the second ranking Sergeant Major in the Corps. He had a horrible reputation. He was a mean man, and he was known as Terrible Tom. When he got out of the Marine Corps, life didn't go very well for him. He was angry, he drank heavily, and finally ended up in prison, and eventually surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. And if you would have met him when I met him, you would have known that he was proud to have served in the Marine Corps, but he was even more proud to serve in the Lord's army. And if you spent just a few minutes with him, you would know that he loved the Lord. He wanted to know if you loved the Lord, and he would be asking you what he could be praying for you about. Terrible Tom. As Christians, the persons we used to be spiritually don't exist anymore. St. Paul put it this way, familiar words. In Jesus Christ, we are new creations. The old has passed away and something new has come. Through our faith in Jesus, we are entirely new creations spiritually. That is, as far as the Lord's concerned, spiritually, our personal houses have been sanitized. They have been purified. They have been washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ, and yet we continue to sin, don't we? Not because our old selves remain. Our old selves refer to who we used to be spiritually before we met Jesus. However, the sin that had had so much influence over our old selves still hangs around and it nags at us, and it tries to convince us that nothing has changed when it really has changed. Our flesh, which had become conditioned over time to respond to sin, it still exists. And it has to be reprogrammed through prayer and studying God's word and intimate fellowship with fellow believers in Jesus in order to reflect the new creation we now are spiritually because of the relationships that we have with Jesus Christ. And so though we are Christians, sin doesn't give up. It continues to attempt to exert its influence over our flesh, and it does so to the end of our earthly lives. And when it's successful in having its influence over us, even as it's as we're, as it does when we're Christians, then it even tries to convince us that we aren't really saved, that spiritually we haven't been cleansed, washed clean by the blood of Jesus, that we aren't new creations at all, and that's a lie. Amen. From the father of lies, the devil himself. The predominant theme of St. Paul's letter to the Philippians is the challenge to look beyond our present circumstances toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so Paul writes in the beginning of this fourth chapter, Brethren whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm firm in the Lord. I'm not exactly sure what I say this morning is going to speak to your needs. Certainly not everything. 
But this is the first instruction, stand firm in the Lord. You may recall that the Philippian church began with a group of women who were praying. St. Luke's written in the 16th chapter of Acts that on the Sabbath, we, uh, I'm assuming that is St. Luke and Silas and Paul, we went outside the gate of, to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to give heed to what was said by Paul. And when she was baptized with her household, she besought us saying, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. In other words, she wouldn't give up until they went to her house and joined her for a meal. Though they were saved, new creations through their faith in Jesus, a couple of the women in the Philippian church, not Lydia, but two women by the name of Euodia and Syntyche were arguing. Now these women were women who had worked diligently alongside Paul and a man named Clement and others in establishing the church in Philippi. They proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ. They were disciples of Jesus Christ. They were followers of Jesus Christ. They were, they were women who were trying to emulate with their lives, to imitate with their lives, the life of Jesus. But they were having a serious disagreement about something. And the issue in Philippi was so serious that news of it had traveled the whole way to Paul, who was in a prison cell in Rome. And that's a significant statement because there was no email and there was no, what are we, Instagram or whatever, texting or emails or whatever these days. In those days, and writing from prison, Paul pleaded with these two sisters in the Lord, Euodice and Syntyche, to re resolve their differences. And he wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Scholars believe that the fact that Paul repeated his instruction to rejoice suggests that the spirit of the entire church had been affected by the severity of the disagreement between these two women and that the directive to rejoice, as we can believe, was probably one that sounded really unreasonable because there was so much unrest. It is amazing how the disease of disagreement can cripple a church. Is that the fire siren? Would you pause with me for just a minute? Father, that, that siren reminds us that, that there is someone or ones who are in need. And even as we hear the siren of the emergency responders that are on their way, hearts palpating, driving fast, I pray that you would take them safely to the fire hall or to the emergency location, and I pray that you would use them effectively, even as I trust you are watching over those in need at this very minute. And we'll thank you for the outcome. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. There are lots of occasions in our lives when because of the circumstances, the last thing we think about doing is rejoicing. But, and maybe this is point number two this morning, as Christians, we are instructed to rejoice because our re reason for rejoicing isn't our circumstances, but rather our relationships with Jesus Christ. Hence the instruction, rejoice in the Lord always. Two people who love each other are generally more happy when they're together, right? no matter what the circumstances may be. I know I and our three daughters would agree that we always feel better when Jackie's around. 
Rejoicing in the Lord isn't just unnatural. And it certainly isn't just forced celebration without merit. As Christians, as followers of and believers in Jesus, the reason for our rejoicing is not the circumstances. It is that Jesus is with us. Christmas season is around the corner. That word, Emmanuel, it doesn't go away after Christmas. We feel better because Jesus is with us. We rejoice because of what he has done for us. And rejoice, we rejoice because of what it means that he has done for us. There's a passage of scripture that I may have recited for you before. It's a passage of scripture that I resisted for a long time because I didn't understand it. It's in 1 Peter chapter 1 where Peter writes, On behalf of the Lord, by my great mercy, you have been born anew to a living hope Amen. through the resurrection of my son Jesus from the dead. And you have been born anew to a living hope and an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, guarded by the power of God for our salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. In this we rejoice, though now for a little while we may have to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of our faith, more precious than gold, which though perishable was tested by fire, may be redound to praise and glory and honor at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith in Jesus Christ is more important to God than gold. Amen. Therefore, we rejoice. The Greek word that's translated rejoice refers to an attitude, it refers to a mood, it does not refer to an attitude and mood based on our circumstances. I am repeating that because I need to hear it. Rejoice refers to our response to God's promises, things we can't acquire on our own, things no one else can possibly provide for us, things which eventually most everyone desires later, if not sooner, and I'm talking about forgiven sins, and the assurance, God's promise of eternal life. Have no anxiety about anything. Paul continued with his letter. I'm a detailed person. And while that can be a good thing, it can be a not so good thing. Even during the period of time when I wasn't serving a church and I was getting bored with retirement, I still made lists for myself every day. Like I needed a list to remember. I'm a detailed person. I get anxious about forgetting things. I get anxious about not having enough time to do things. I get anxious when someone else might forget to do things. And what's most importantly, I get anxious about something even possibly going haywire. Now in my defense, while details might be, not be your issue, most of us have things that make us anxious. And I remind you that that's that power of sin and flesh thing again. I've been conditioned, so to speak, over the course of my lifetime to be anxious about certain things and consequently, as I shared with the men yesterday, this past week was a really challenging week. 
I deal with this anxiety issue from time to time, even after all these years that I've been a Christian. And when I'm really anxious about something, that is when I should be reminded that it's the power of sin that's getting a grip on me. And it will even try to convince me that because I don't seem to be trusting God, I am not saved. Can you relate to that? Anxiety is a funny thing. It's responsible for behavior that's contrary to being an effective witness for Jesus Christ. Anxiety is a funny thing because it's responsible for behavior that doesn't particularly make who we are as Christians seem appealing to other people. Anxiety is a funny thing because it's responsible for behavior that isn't inviting to other people who might be interested in a relationship with Jesus. And that may be why after instructing the Philippian Christians and us to rejoice, that Paul wrote, let all people know your forbearance. Or if you use the New International Version, it says, let all people know your gentleness. Or if you read the Living Bible, it says, let all people know your unselfishness and consideration. Believe it or not, it's such a difficult word to translate that many scholars consider it to be one of the most difficult words in the New Testament to understand. The ancient Greeks, though, understood it to be the quality of knowing when not to apply the letter of the law. Let all people know your forbearance, your gentleness, your unselfishness and consideration. The quality of knowing when not to apply the letter of the law. The ancient Greeks understood forbearance or gentleness or unselfishness and consideration to be knowing when to relax and be merciful. Being merciful is not returning to people what they deserve. We are all glad that God is merciful with us, not I like that word not because it's kind of, when you add that, it reminds me that I'm a Pennsylvania Dutchman, which I'm proud. <laughs> but being merciful is not a natural thing, especially if we're treated unjustly. What we're more inclined to do is retaliate. But you see, that's the flesh. That is the old self. That's the continuing influence of the power of sin. And so we've got to constantly be reminded that because of our faith in Jesus, we truly are new creations. I forget that. Our old self, who we used to be, is gone. And so what used to be natural for us isn't natural anymore, even though our flesh may want us to act like it's natural. Does that sound like it's a bunch of mumbo jumbo? I had a prayer partner who died next, next Saturday, it'll be one year ago. We were prayer partners for 30 years. I don't know if I mentioned that to you when I was here prior or, or not. His name was Bill Shaw. He was about 15 years older than me. He considered us to be friends. I considered him to be a mentor. He was so much more than a friend. And uh, to lose a friend like that is, uh, is just a significant loss. And, and he knew me so well. And he'd say to me, Steve, what should you be anxious about? And he'd have a little smile on his face. Nothing. Nothing. Paul writes in Philippians 4, 6, have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be, made, be known to God. Paul's prescription for us when we're anxious is, first of all, to pray. It's what we, what we do when we're really anxious about something is we want to talk to someone, right? And Paul says, here's an idea, talk to God. 
talk to our Heavenly Father. After all, nothing's a surprise for him. Nothing is impossible for him. And believe it or not, nothing is more important to our Heavenly Father than hearing from us, his children, about things. You know, yesterday I went to a soccer game and one of our grandchildren came running up to me and he, she handed me these two little cards that she made. And it starts out, Paul, Paul, you're the best Paul, Paul in the whole world. And then, I guess in case she thought I didn't get it, she wrote me another one. <laughs> you know, I keep things like this. To know that your children and your grandchildren love you and appreciate you, you know how much that means to us. Our Heavenly Father wants to be reminded by our engaging in Him in conversation that, that we appreciate Him, that we love Him. So Paul says, first of all, pray. Second, ask for what you need. The word supplication is used there. The New International Version uses the word petition. Both words mean to ask humbly, which is, that is exactly what we do when we have a request for someone, an authority who we respect, who's able to provide what we need, right? When we need something or someone that we know that has it can provide it, we don't go proudly over to them and we, we demand it. We approach them humbly and hope that they'll provide it for us. Pray and then ask, and then finally Paul says, Wrap your requests in thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for what God has done for us in his son Jesus. Every single day, regardless what the day seems like, Father showers us with blessings. I was saying to the men yesterday when, when I was driving up here, I was just so taken in by the color of the leaves on the trees and so forth. Blessings. And if we can't think of anything else for which to be thankful, there is always God's constant presence with us, no matter what we're going through. Maybe if you don't remember anything else I say this morning, if you're reminded that God is always present. I like what he said through the prophet Isaiah in the 43rd chapter of Isaiah's prophetic book. Father says, I've created you. I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. He knows us by the, our most intimate, personal name. He says, you are mine. We belong to Jesus Christ. When you pass through water, I'll be with you. Rivers shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. The flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. We're his. And so if we talk to God, if we ask God for whatever we need and wrap our conversations with God in thanksgiving, if we do that, Paul declares that Father promises peace. He promises peace. And that Greek word, arene, that's translated peace is the equivalent of the Hebrew word shalom. It means wholeness. It means completeness. It means being finished. It means having wholesome relationships with God and wholesome relationships with other people. It includes being emotionally and spiritually at ease. That's peace. We just throw that word around all the time. And such a thing is beyond our ability to understand it. In the sense that shalom is something that's only available from God as our relationship with him becomes more and more intimate. You can't get too close to God. And the rewards of being close to God just exceed our comprehension. We probably, we probably take peace, even that peace, for granted when we're sailing along in life and things are going smoothly. I thought about that yesterday when Phil, when you were, when you were sharing, and how quickly we could get a different outlook on things when the, when the storms hit. It's during the, during the storms of life, when peace is disrupted, when peace is obliterated, that, 
And we have an important choice to make. We can try to manage on our own, maybe asking God for a little help when we realize that we can't solve the issue on our own. Or we can surrender to our Heavenly Father. We can draw close to Him. We can talk to Him. We can listen to Him. We can ask Him for the help we need. We can thank Him. We can experience His holiness and His unconditional love. And then allow ourselves to be filled with the peace that God promises and which he alone can provide. My prayer for you as individuals, my prayer is for you as families, my prayer for you as a church family, for, if I may, us as a church family for a period of time, is that we might allow that peace of God to fulfill, fulfill our, fill our hearts that what it means to be merciful might rise to the surface. That we might follow that prescription of Paul, pray and ask and wrap our prayer in thanksgiving. He always hears, he always answers, he's always faithful. And I, above all, need to be reminded of Father, we thank you for this time to be in your word with one another, and I pray in Jesus' name that what you have spoken, your heart to ours, would contribute to the transformation of our lives and the transformation of the life of this church family, whatever that's going to look like. We know we'll glorify you. I pray in Jesus' name.